Chapter 22. Match Made on Earth. Brad confided to a friendly female colleague that he had recently divorced. A week later, she gave him a newspaper clipping advertising an event to be held by a professional matchmaking service. Don't take any more chances. Let the pros find the right one for you, she said. Doctors shouldn't be going online to find a relationship. I would hate to see you go through that again. He was touched by her concern and took the clipping. He went and enjoyed the crab, sushi, and wine, and by the end of the meal, the all-female staff had convinced him to pay the $5,000 membership fee. Two weeks later, he found himself in an office overlooking Market Street, getting grilled by a pretty Japanese psychologist. He shared with her the strange reoccurring dream he'd been having about meeting a woman from a faraway place, and that upon awakening, he would have the feeling that he knew that woman somehow, creating a deja vu experience. He told her that his lifelong desire for a soulmate was gone now. The search for the one had caused nothing but problems ending with catastrophe. A suitable companion would do. She took nearly three hours to inquire about his inner world, uncovering his desires, his failures, his spiritual journey, and opening him up about his childhood trauma. Then she said, I think I have someone for you. He was startled. How could she match someone to all that? Her name is Eli Yamashita. You will meet at a Starbucks near where she lives. We will call you with a time and date. You will limit it to one hour, and please report back to me afterward. Good luck, doctor. She held out a hand, and when she shook it, he felt her warmth. He also caught a strange twinkle in her eye. You have had an amazing life, Brad. I think Ellie will like you. They met the following week. Ellie recognized the man sitting on a bench in the outdoor mall by Starbucks as her date. Lost in thought, he failed to notice her presence until she was almost upon him. He looked in her eyes. Hello, are you Ellie? Yes, and you must be Brad. She was pretty, in a magenta dress and heels, and her eyes sparkled. He stood up quickly and thought to bow Japanese style, but she stuck her arm out quickly and they clasped hands. Nice to meet you. Konbanwa, o genki desu ka? He said, proud that he had studied a few words of her native language. Good evening, she said. I need to practice my English. I've only been in the U.S. for two years. She giggled. How about getting the coffee? As soon as they got in line, their conversation began to flow easily. Onlookers might have thought they were old friends or even lovers. Ellie enforced the rules. The date ended after precisely one hour. Brad reported back to the psychologist and told her he wanted a second date. She agreed, and they met days later at her favorite Japanese restaurant. They had been at the table for over two hours getting to know each other. He told her of his childhood desire to become an astronaut and about why he believed there must be life on other planets. He even told her about what had pushed him onto a spiritual journey. I had an experience where the everyday appearance of things as separate objects suddenly became just an idea in my mind. Then the whole idea vanished. I realized that things are naturally all interconnected, including us, and I could see them that way. Uh, of course, there are many teachings about it, it's called unity. But to go around every day and see myself and the world as one, and that is inspiring. I love it, she said. I have been on a spiritual journey too, and I want to experience unity. An odd look came over her and her eyes appeared to deepen. He knew to be silent and wait. Finally, she said something that reverberated deeply within him. I have waited 43 years to meet you. The words struck a melodic chord deep within, and it was music to his ears. That must be the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. She blushed. I am not sure why I said it. It just came to me. They saw each other often after that. Brad tried to analyze the mystery that was behind their immediate deep bond, but he could not. She was in his heart, and that went much deeper than the mind ever could. There were no pressures, no demands, no conflicts. Their bond was imbued with love and harmony forming a relationship that was like a third thing that had a life of its own, existing between them, yet bigger, containing them. It went beyond what words could express or thoughts could comprehend. The dream of meeting a girl from far away was realized, but he had no idea from how far away she had truly come. Ellie's parents and older brother arrived at SFO from Okayama on the day of the wedding. In their room at a Marriott, Ellie introduced her parents to Brad as Atasan. 
and Akasan, father and mother. They bowed politely and spoke in Japanese, which Ellie translated. Okasan was bent over, leaning on a cane with one arm, and gave Brad a kind smile. Achasan stood rigidly, eyes like coals burning through thick black framed glasses, supporting his wife by her other arm. They were slightly shorter than Ellie's five foot three frame and almost as petite. The brother shook Brad's hand and they made their way to the parking lot where they all fit nicely into a rented black Nissan Xterra. During the drive, Brad made small talk while Ellie translated. Artisan, what do you think of the U.S. so far? Okay, that's one, he said, meaning it is big. They arrived early at the wedding hall which gave Okasan time to hobble around and sniff the gorgeous displays of flowers that Ellie had selected. Tables with white cloth, opened bottles of wine, and bow-tied servers stocking a long buffet with Japanese and American cuisine made for an elegant atmosphere. The minister arrived, chatted with the newlyweds in a small side room, then met the rest of the Yamashita family. Otasan was respectful, bowing twice. They took the seats reserved for them in the front row near the flowery gazebo at one end of the great room. The couple went to stand in their places by the minister. You're not starting without us, a voice boomed from across the hall. It was his brother Glenn, tall and gray-haired, ushering in Natalie, who was shortened and bent from spinal osteoporosis. Brad steeled for a disturbance. Natalie, huffing from the exertion, was dolled up in her best lavender dress. She and Glenn sat in the back row. His brother Jeffrey and his wife, as well as several of Ellie's and Brad's friends, were already seated. Friends and family, began the minister. We begin by asking for God's blessing. Don't bring God into this, Glenn's voice rang out from the back row. Natalie put a hand on his shoulder and whispered into his ear. Oops, sorry, everyone. I'm an atheist. The holy man went on and wedding vows were exchanged. Then the minister handed them rings, which they put on each other's fingers. After that, he introduced Mr. and Mrs. Rosedale to the assembly. Brad felt inspired beyond words the many years of imagining there was a perfect soulmate waiting for him, the attempts and the failures to find her, all of it was now a whiff of past memories. This wondrous occasion symbolized a far greater inner discovery, that he was done with the search. Ellie completed him in a way that he could not fathom with his mind. It was a transformation of his heart, an expansion, an emerging of two beings. From that moment on, he would protect it with his life and never for a moment dishonor it. Cheers, applause, and Glenn's thunders, yeah, filled the air. Next, the guests lined up at the buffet, and the newlyweds stood in the arch of the lovely gazebo for photos. Otosan beamed proudly next to his gorgeous daughter in her white wedding dress. Brad thought he looked odd standing so bolt upright, like a military commander. Glenn staked out a table and announced, Rosedale's over here. Then he took Natalie to the front of the buffet line. Excuse me, groom's mother goes first. Guests backed away to avoid getting stuck by the big man's elbow, and Glenn grabbed plates for himself and Natalie. Then he went ahead and piled food on his plate, leaving Natalie to pick her way slowly through the variety of foods, while the line backed up halfway around the tables. Aromas that would please both carnivores and vegetarians wafted out to the hungry guests. Prime rib, sautéed mushrooms, Japanese curried fish, handmade sushi rolls, and mixed seasonal vegetables were offered, and more. Brad had spared no expense on the buffet as if it would cure the trauma of childhood hunger that the Rosedale brothers had known. Ellie broke through the line and fixed small plates of sushi for her parents, who had sat down due to Okasan's difficulty navigating the crowd. It was past their normal mealtime, and Otasan got mean when he was hungry. Across the Pacific Ocean, away from his roots in Okayama, he would never show it. But still, Ellie wasn't taking a chance. The Yamashitas were getting informal introductions to the Rosedale brothers. Hey, Brad! There's a problem. It was Brother Sam calling across two tables. Rob locked himself in a room and won't come out. I think he and Darla got into it. They arrived late and she was holding a rag over her eye. Here comes the family drama, thought Brad. He looked for Ellie, who was busy with some guests. Then he walked over to Sam. What can I do? Was the best he could come up with. It's my wedding, bro. Do me a favor. Can you get security? Dude, it's our brother, said Sam. Would you go talk to him? He'll listen to you. You're the oldest. He finished off his beer. I need another one. Then he left for the liquor table. There was that curse of being the oldest. It reminded Brad of why he left the family so many years ago. His younger brothers didn't have that privilege, and now they were broken. 
My mother and I do not drink alcohol. I've been clean and sober for 18 years. Get that shit away from me. Glenn's voice was so loud, everyone stopped and stared. This is a non-alcoholic table now, he declared. Jeffrey and his wife got up. They could have complied with Glenn's alcohol ban, but it was a good excuse to get away from the most emotionally unstable of the brothers. Sorry, Mom, said Jeffrey as they left. Sam and his wife, who weren't about to stop drinking, immediately moved to another table. Rob's girl, Darla, was now wearing sunglasses to cover up her black eye. She got up and moved, too. The drinkers gone, Glenn smirked in triumph, stretched his neck, and took stock of the room like he owned the place. A server scurried around the table, which now only had two guests, and removed the wine glasses and all bottles containing alcohol. White knuckle sobriety, they called it. And after 18 years, no wonder no one could stand to be around Glenn for more than a few minutes, except Natalie. But she had taken her share of abuse from her moody son. On his way out, the minister stopped and asked Brad, Would you like me to talk to your brother? Which one? Brad almost asked. Instead, he handed him a small roll of cash for his tip and said, My best advice is to get out while you can, Pastor. None of my family is going to change. Thanks for asking. They shook hands and the minister exited. Brad went to find Sam, who was at the liquor table with a freshly opened Heineken. Let's go talk to Rob, he said. I gave Rob a try and he didn't want to talk. It's your turn, bro. Room 237. Sam put his lips around the bottle and took another swig. Brad passed Jeffrey, who was seated with his wife and several of Ellie's Japanese friends. They were all being cordial with each other and enjoying the food with sips of wine. He took a detour. Enjoy yourself at my wedding, brother, he thought, even if I can't. What, he wondered, had happened between Bob and Darla? He looked at Darla's eye and saw a bad bruise that needed ice. She said it was from hitting the car door on her way in. That sounded far-fetched, but despite the nasty fights their parents had had, the Rosedale brothers had never been known to hit a woman. Darla, do you have a headache, dizziness, blurred vision? He asked, wondering if he should send her to the local ER. No, I'm fine. I've had worse than this, and I swear he didn't hit me. If he did, the police would be here, trust me. She said clearly and earnestly, still worried he had to let it go. Accidents do happen. Please call or go to the nearest emergency room if you get any of those symptoms. Yes, Dr. Brad, she said politely. Then he went upstairs and arrived at room 237. This is Brad. Open the door, Rob. He knocked for a minute. Rob. There was no answer, so he threatened to get the manager. Stop banging the door, you ass. I'll be right down, came the reply. The older brother went back to his wedding reception and updated Sam. They were smart to keep Glenn out of it and avoid a bad scene. Soon enough, Rob staggered into the reception, looking like he had cleaned out the minibar. Brad rushed over to keep him away from their guests, and Ellie brought some coffee. That stupid bitch, said Rob. She's killing me, he went on, but the words were slurred and nonsensical. Darla made no effort to come over. They decided he should go back to the room and sleep it off. Then Sam came over. What the hell, Rob? Are you trying to ruin our brother's wedding or what? Sam was carrying another bottle of beer, which made at least six by now, but he could hold his liquor. Sam told Rob where he should go, and the conversation heated up. Rob waved his arms and knocked over a bottle of wine. It poured out on the white tablecloth and could have been mistaken for a streak of blood. Fortunately, no blood would be shed that day. Brad jumped in. Guys, hey, Glenn's over there. If he sees you acting drunk, it's all over. The threat registered. Nobody wanted to see Glenn go nuts or to endure the fallout from someone's 911 call. Police, an ambulance, someone getting stitched up at an ER, and probably an arrest or two. Sorry, brother, Sam said. I'll handle this. From somewhere deep inside, a spot of goodness had surfaced, and he stuffed the macho act and took Rob back to room 237, where the blurry-eyed brother passed out for the rest of the evening. Throughout the disturbance, the Yamashita sat politely as Ellie attended to them, and guests milled around, gathering their things and leaving earlier than expected. Glenn had told a horrible crack addict recovery story that had someone crying. The unruly Rosedale family made a hard contrast of cultures to the orderly Yamashitas. Brad marveled at what lay behind the destinies that had brought him and Ellie together. He would solve that mystery someday, no matter what it took. The newlyweds took an all-inclusive honeymoon at a resort in Mexico, where they rode a zipline over the beach, and Brad learned of Ellie's fear of swimming. Their bond, which started the moment they'd met, only deepened. Anything that could provoke marital conflict was a ripple on the surface and made Brad muse beyond the dream of a faraway girl, believing that they had known each other in a past life. During their honeymoon, they explored each other's desires, 
He told her about his childhood dreams and how she might be the one that was making those dreams come true. She believed in reincarnation, having been raised in the Buddhist tradition. They shared the idea that they had a past life together and were destined to meet, but the talk ran its course and there were no revelations. Ellie said that if they had a past life together, it was not going to be remembered now, and Brad couldn't argue with that. Their life became a pleasant routine, and Brad prospered from Ellie's nurturing and frugality. He worked harder, saving to ensure that they would enjoy the future together. Then they went to Japan to spend a week at the home of the Yamashita family, making their bed where several generations had lived, loved, and passed on. There wasn't a hint of the higher bond they had formed before their births.